Hi, folks. This is Dr. Rob Silas. Um, I am the Carb Addiction Doc, and um, we are doing a four-part series on inflammation. And it's not just all kinds of inflammation. It is specific to, to our dietary inflammation. And more specific than that, it is about the inflammation that sugar causes in the different compartments of the body. You see, <clears throat> um, sugar travels through four compartments in the human body. Starts in the GI tract, the gut, then the bloodstream, then the interstitial space, and then the cells. And each one of these four videos explores a particular uh, cause of damage that chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption does. So today's video, we're going to look at the gut, the entry point, the entry point. And we're going to follow sugar through the intestine and, and the foods that come along with sugar. So when we eat carbohydrates, either as a sugar or a starch, it starts out in our mouth. And we chew on that sugar. And that sugar in high concentrations affects, first and foremost, our oral cavity and our nasal cavity from two perspectives. Number one, the high concentrations of sugar damage our gums, which are mucous membranes, damage the lining cells of our mouth and of our nasal cavity. That's what happens. Then that sugar goes down the esophagus into the stomach, and in the stomach it encounters acid. So already in the mouth, the saliva is starting to break that down. So there's certain enzymes that are in the mouth that are breaking some of that sugar down, the complex sugar into its individual glucose, fructose, galactose molecules. But when it hits the stomach, sugar has certain inflammatory effects in the stomach. Number one, it, there's an overproduction of, of gastric acid, particularly when you are insulin resistant. You overproduce acid, so you're producing huge amounts of acid. Secondly, sugar relaxes the tightness of the lower esophageal sphincter, this little sphincter, this little regulatory muscle that controls uh, food and fluid entry from the esophagus into the stomach and acts as a one-way valve and should prevent it from going back up. That valve should open to allow things to go down and then contract and stay contracted like your butthole to prevent things from just seeping back up. So sugar relaxes that muscle. So now you get relaxation of that lower esophageal sphincter. And now if you've overeaten with the stomach as your stomach churns, when your stomach squeezes to expel the food out of the stomach downstream, it squeezes both ways. And some of that food goes back up. You get gastroesophageal reflux. And both the acid and the sugar goes back up into the esophagus and sits there and can change the lining of the cells in that lower esophageal sphincter. Because remember, the esophagus is alkaline, the stomach is acid. So what happens is if you've got a lot of acid going back into, up into those cells, acid burns those endothelial cells. No, not the endothelial cells, the squamous mucosal cells of the esophagus which is supposed to be alkaline. And the way the body protects it, it says, no, 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 no. Let's change these squamous cells to columnar cells, to the same cells that are in the stomach that protect it against acid. So you get these ellipses, these lines, these streaks or patches of columbar, uh, of, of columbar. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Not enough sugar in my brain. Um, we get a transformation of the mucous membrane to columnar epithelium. And while that is resistant to acid, it is a very unstable form of cell. And then acted on by the sugar and the acid, those cells can transform and become precancerous or cancerous, and we call that Barrett's esophagitis. And we see patients with cancer in that lower esophagus from reflux and from sugar and from acid. Acid suppression helps a little bit, but you don't need that if you don't eat the sugar because the sphincter returns back to normal. So it is very, very common for people that eat a high sugar diet to have gastroesophageal reflux disease and eventually get Barrett's esophagitis. And then you use a very toxic pill to get rid of the reflux acid production, your Prilosex, your PPIs, your uh, H2 blockers, which are now banned in this country for the most part. Toxic, toxic drugs to deal with with the side effects of another toxic drug, sugar. doesn't make any sense to me. But carbohydrates are by far the commonest cause of gastroesophageal reflux disease. And how do you get carbohydrates into your body? 
vegetables, fruits, and as processed foods. Those are the three sources of carbohydrates. So the stomach churns them up, gets them into the small intestine. And in the small intestine, that high concentration of sugar affects the lining cells of the small intestine. It affects the types of enzymes that break those sugars down and affects the lining of, those, of the cells of that small intestine, changing the pH of the intestine. Because the foods that come along with sugar are not human foods. They're not human foods. The human body biolog biologically has changed over time for the most part to no longer be a fermenter of food, but to use enzymes to break food down. So the more vegetables and fruits and other things that we're eating, the more fermentation is happening in the stomach, in the intestine. And the bacteria that are associated with that fermentation process damages the intestine, particularly the colon. The types of bacteria, the biome that goes along with vegetable material damages the intestine, particularly the colon. So we get diverticulitis, we get uh, colonic inflammation, ulcerative colitis, uh, Crohn's disease and irritable bowel syndrome, gas bloat syndrome, and possibly even colon cancer. Not promoted by, oh, red meat causes colon cancer. No, it's not. It's the vegetables you ate the red meat with. Blaming red meat for colon cancer is like blaming the match instead of the cigarette for your lung cancer. Because human beings have all the, ev uh, the evolved enzymes to take care of meat. We're very good at breaking that down. We're very good at handling protein and fat. The enterohepatic circulation of bile handles fat. We've got a whole circulation system for that called the lymphatic circulation system. We break down meat really, really well. Not, not able to break down cellulose. Not able to break down the majority of the sugar that occurs in vegetable material. Now, most vegetables, the leafy vegetables, not awful. But there is a subset of really, really, really toxic uh, uh, vegetable products, if you want to call them that. And those are the grains. Grain products are super toxic to the human body, either subclinically or clinically, if you have clinical experience with celiac disease, with gluten or gliadin uh, uh, um, allergies, with histamine reactions, that typically comes from your grain products. But the rices and the potatoes add to that as well. And they cause inflammation in the human intestine. And that ramped up inflammatory system damages the intestine. But also, the same triggering can now spill over into the bloodstream. And those same uh, uh, immune system that is now ramped up against things like gluten and gliadin in the intestine because you've been eating a bunch of bread, they, those, that, that immune system, the cells and the antibodies are so similar to other parts of the human body like insulin, like thyroid hormone, that you now get this cross-reaction. You get this cross-reaction where the body is actually attacking itself, thinking it, it's a foreign body. And we call that autoimmune disease. And there are so many different areas where autoimmune disease attacks the human body. And that's because of that cross-reaction to foreign antibodies, to foreign antigens that come into the human body primarily as part of our diet. So eating a high carbohydrate diet, including primarily the grains, the vegetables, and the fruits, very, very toxic to the entire intestine and affects the intestine in a multitude of different ways. So if you've got any of those GI upsets, and you lean more heavily toward an enzymatic rather than a fermentation process in your gut, and slowly over the course of months convert yourself to being an enzyme nutritional producer rather than a fermentation nutrition producer, 
you'll find that a lot of those inflammatory conditions will subside. Now, folks, I'm kind of fortunate. I don't have those as a clinical problem. If I eat bread, if I eat uh, grain products, if I eat vegetables, if I eat fruit, I don't have gastric inflammation. Does that upset me? Does it give me some gas bloat? Absolutely. But it's very tolerable. Other people are intolerable to that. My brother-in-law has severe, severe allergic gluten toxicity. So it affects different people variably. But you know what's interesting? Is if I've been on a carnivore diet for a long time, and I even just eat a salad or eat some vegetables, let alone some grain products, for three or four days afterwards, it really disrupts my system. Do the experiment. See, you're not going to know how bad the GI inflammatory space is until you get rid of it for a while. Test yourself. Do the experiment. Go pure carnivore for maybe 90 days. Oh my God, it's three months. Three months in, in the course of 100 years is very, very little. Try it sometime. Go pure carnivore for 90 days. Write down some of the GI symptoms that you may have and have an awareness. You don't have to be a doctor. There's no blood tests or measurables that you need to do. Just do the experiment of time. And you'll be amazed at how much better your reflux gets, how much better you sleep, how much less your heart palpita uh, palpitates. Is that the right word? I'm a doctor. I should know, shouldn't I? <laughs> um, look at how your bowel movements change. Look at the diarrhea, the constipation, the cramping, the gas bloat. Do the experiment. See how much it improves you. That is the inflammation of sugar and sugar-containing products as they travel through the intestine in a place where they no longer belong. I'm not a total advocate for the carnivore diet. I'm just saying that that is a good elimination diet to do the experiment. And then you can pitch yourself. I choose not to eat the grain products. I choose not to eat the starches, but I eat vegetables from time to time. I'm mostly carnivore, not because it's better or healthier for me, because it doesn't matter. It's just easier and simpler, and I like to eat that way. But some people do need to make that change. The only way to know is to eliminate the source of inflammation to your GI tract over the course of maybe 90 days, three months. That gives your body enough time to change on the inside. And then see what happens. And then see what happens. And by the way, just one last word of, of wisdom. All of you taking probiotics, all of you taking those probiotics or prebiotics to replenish the gut flora of your intestine. Those are vegetable probiotics. Those are fermentation-based probiotics. So if you're leaning more toward a healthier carnivore diet, if you're staying away from all those vegetable products, and you're trying to populate your gut with uh, the microbiome of a more carnivorous way of life, why the hell are you taking a probiotic that keeps replenishing the sugary side, at least the, uh, the sugar and the... And the um, Vegetable side, it doesn't make logical sense. Of course, the advertisements are wonderful. Your choice. I wouldn't do it. I don't. Do the experiment, and then you can pitch yourself where you want to be. Vegetables and animal products are perfectly fine on a ketogenic diet. You decide what makes your intestinal space the healthiest. I am the carb addiction doc. Please, I know there's going to be a lot of you yelling and shouting and screaming at the screen right now. Leave your comments down below. I welcome them. Good or bad. I welcome them. And if you're interested in a consult with us, text us or email or, 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 or call 561-517-0642. We can set up a consult. I am a practicing doctor. And let's see if we can restore the human body to its rightful place amongst mammals as a small letter omni, large word carnivore, omni-carnivore species. Till next time.